Father, we firstly I thank you, Lord, that you gave Carol and I a break. And we thank you for the lovely people here who were willing to send us away and looked after the church while we were away too, Lord. I thank you for that. This morning, Lord, as we come around your word, we pray that you would speak to us through your word. Let your word go deep down into our hearts and produce the fruit that you desire in each one of us. We willingly submit to the authority and the leading of your Holy Spirit this morning. Bless your word to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. My topic this morning is on forgiveness. Forgiveness is one of the things that I struggled with even after I became a Christian. In my earlier years with the Lord, um, I struggled with, I would say, maybe 10 years after becoming a, a Christian, I still struggled with forgiveness, particularly towards my father. And you all know the story of um, my uh, childhood and, and upbringing. But as the years went on, God gave me the grace and taught me what real forgiveness was all about. And I was free to love and forgive him after that. But as I move around and as I talk to people, even in Christian circles, I still hear that they too struggle with forgiveness. And hopefully what I share this morning will be a blessing to you and will help you as it helped me. One of the supporting pillars of any beneficial relationships is forgiveness. Especially in a marriage and in a family environment and that includes in a church family as well. The definition and practice of forgiveness typically, typically varies from person to person which leads to unrealistic expectations and often disheartening results. To us believers there should be no confusion however about forgiveness. Being at the heart of Christianity from a biblical perspective no activity of our Christian life is more closely aligned to the love of God and the willing sacrifice of Christ than forgiving somebody. C.S. Lewis made this telling remark. He said, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. Forgiveness, folks, is truly a Christian virtue. Consider these words of our Lord Jesus. He says, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. And that's found in Luke 6 and verse 37. But you don't know what he did to me, pastor, or what she did to me. They lied about me over and over again. You can't imagine the hell I've been through. If you knew what that person has done to me and my family, you would be angry too. They deserve to suffer like they've made me suffer. I'm going to make them pay. I will never forgive that person. And I can go on and I can go on. On the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus said it very plainly. If you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you don't, this is very important folks, but if you don't, your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Then the Apostle Paul put forgiveness into a slightly different Framework In Ephesians 4.32 he says this, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, 
just as Christ forgave you. In Colossians 3.13, he said, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances. Not being selective of what you forgive and what you don't forgive, but forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Then in 1 Corinthians 13, which is called the love chapter, I recommend this chapter be read in every home, especially among couples and families on a regular basis. Verse 5 says this, Paul declared that love keeps no record of wrongs. This little phrase deserves a lot of meditation and close examination. And I love the way the Message Bible puts it. It puts it so well. It says, love does not keep score. Because love has a bad memory, it finds a way to forget the sins of others. Then, of course, we have the greatest and the most purest and most profound statement on this topic in the entire Bible. The finest and the purest and the highest example of forgiveness. When Jesus hung on the cross, condemned to death by evil men who plotted his murder, who produced lying witnesses to convict him. As he hung on the cross, he surveyed the mob that were around him, assembled to cheer his suffering. Jesus, the Son of God, the one who knew no sin, the only true innocent man who ever walked on this planet earth. In his dying moments, he uttered words that still ring across the universe centuries later. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. In Luke chapter 23, 34. Those words, folks, sweep away all our shabby excuses. They reveal the barrenness of our hearts. They rip the cover of our unrighteous anger and show it for what, it's, what it is. Many of us, now I'm speaking generally here, say if the person or the people who hurt me will show remorse, some sorrow, then maybe I would forgive them. But folks, since that rarely happens, we can use that as an excuse to continue in our bitterness our anger and our desire to get even. Consider Jesus on the cross once again. No one seemed to be sorry. Even as he uttered those words, the crowd laughed at him and mocked him and cheered and hurled insults at him, the Bible says. They taunted him saying, if you are the king of Israel, come down from the cross and save yourself. When he died, the people who put him to death were quite pleased with themselves. Pilate washed his hands over the entire mat matter. Evil was in the air that day. The forces of darkness has done their work and the Son of God would be laid in a tomb. This is important, folks. No one said I was wrong that day. This was a mistake. We were such fools. And yet he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. What love, what forgiveness, so undeserving. It is hard, yes, very hard sometimes, but this is precisely what we must say if we are going to truly follow Jesus Christ. We must say to the people who hurt us deliberately and repeatedly, we must say it to those who intentionally attack us. We must say it to those who casually and thoughtlessly wound us. We must say it to our closest friends, to our family, to our husband, to our wife, to our children, to our parents, to our friends, to our neighbors, and to our brothers and sisters in Christ. 
My next point is forgiveness is difficult in part because we do not understand it properly. Let me list some of the misconceptions about forgiveness. Let me, let me list a few things forgiveness does not mean. It doesn't mean approving of what someone else has done. It doesn't mean pretending that evil did not happen. It doesn't mean making excuses for other people's bad behavior. It does not mean justifying evil so that sin somehow becomes less sinful. It does not mean overlooking abuse. It does not mean letting others walk over you. It doesn't mean refusing to press charges when a crime has been committed. It doesn't mean pretending that you were never hurt. It doesn't mean you, you must become best friends again with that person. And lastly, it doesn't mean all negative consequences of sin are cancelled. This is very important, folks. It doesn't mean all negative consequences of sin are cancelled. And I can go on and on. But imagine for a moment, this is an illustration. I was seen in a nightclub, engaged in activities that would embarrass Christ, firstly, and then embarrass this church. And my activities were then exposed to the leadership of this church and to the congregation. I would ask you for forgiveness. Forgiveness may, may be granted, but I would expect to lose my job as a pastor in this church. You see, forgiveness does not cancel the negative consequences of our foolish decisions and choices that we make in life. I remember a treasurer in a church, a young man, young family, was exposed for embezzling funds from the church. When the church found out he was exposed, yes, forgiveness was offered to him. Lots of crying, lots of tears, lots of sorrow. Forgiveness was offered, but the matter still had to be reported to the police. And sadly, he had to spend time in jail. You see, forgiveness does not cancel all the negative consequences of our foolish decisions or choices. In June this year, many of us from this church attended a Safe Church Awareness course. It was a full day course. Everything taught on that day was to do with maintaining a high moral and ethical standard to keep each one of us safe in this church. In the eyes of the law, of course, and of course in the eyes of God as well. And any breach of those standards could lead to a criminal, uh, criminal uh, consequences. So forgiveness can be offered, but the consequences of our foolish decisions, there is a price to pay for that, folks. It cannot cancel the negative consequences of our behavior. Next point is forgiveness is a matter of the heart. This is very important, folks, because most of us, and now generally speaking, think forgiveness is primarily about what we do or what we say. It is quite possible to mouth kind words of forgiveness while harboring anger and bitterness within. Forgiveness begins in the heart and eventually works its way outward. There is a profound sense in which forgiveness, even forgiving someone who hurt you deeply, is between you and God. And the other people or the other person may not even know about it or not even understand. Forgiveness in its essence is a decision made on the inside to refuse to live in the past. To refuse to live in the past. It is a conscious choice to release others from their sin against you that you can be set free. You know, holding a grudge against somebody, you think that person is suffering. 
but not so it's you. I remember re uh, reading this phrase somewhere. It says, um, holding a grudge against someone is like you drinking a cup of poison hoping the other person dies. It never happens. Never happens. It doesn't deny that the pain or the thing of the past never happened. But it does break the cycle of bitterness in you and in me and the wounds of yesterday. Forgiveness allows you and me to let go and move on. We can forgive or we must forgive even if the other person makes no confession. We must forgive even if the other person has done nothing to earn our forgiveness. Because forgiveness is like salvation, folks. It is a gift that is freely given. It cannot be earned. We, cannot, we can forgive the other person and he may never even know about it. Why? Because forgiveness is a matter of the heart. This brings me back to C.S. Lewis's statement. Everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. Then it becomes difficult. One day the Apostle Paul came to Jesus, sorry, Apostle Peter came to Jesus and asked him, how many times I'm supposed to forgive my brother? In Matthew 18. And what did Jesus say? He said, told him 70 times 7. Do the math, it's 490 times. And that's a lot of sin. That's a lot of hurt. That's a lot of pain. And that's a whole lot of forgiveness offered to someone else. I'm on 478, Carol, right now. It seems impossible and definitely impractical, but that's exactly what Jesus said. Then Jesus told the story of the man who owed a boss a lot of money. And let's read that story. It's quite important. I'm going to get Ning now to read the text. It's from Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will I will my brother sin against me and, and forgive him? As many as seven times, Jesus said to him, do not say to you, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished, a, who wished to settle an account with his servants. When he began to settle one, he was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master had ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and the payment, he, and the payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant realized, released him and forgave him the debt. But when, he, but, when the serv, but when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred dairies, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw that he had taken, saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their masters all that had taken place. Then, then this master summoned, summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you and all the debt because you pleaded with me. And you, and you should not, and you should not, and you should not have, ha, uh, and you should not, and you should not, you, uh, sorry guys, just, <laughs> and you, uh, and, and should not you have had mercy on a fellow servant, 
as I had mercy on you, the jailers, uh, and servant on you. And, and in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until, until, he, until, he, until, he, until he should pay all his debt. So, so also my heavenly Father will not do everything one, will not do everything one to you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Thanks, Ning. Some translations uh, in verse 34 uses the word tormentors or torturers. But I want to bring your attention to verse 35, folks. It's so important. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. This is so important for us. These words are for believers, not unbelievers, because he talks in context of brothers. Jesus said, what happened to that man will happen to you and me unless we learn to forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. He says, otherwise the tormentors will come and torment you. The tormentors will come and take you away and torture you. What tormentors? The hidden tormentors of anger and bitterness that eat us from the inside. The tormentors that make us lie awake at night stewing over rotten things that have happened to us. The tormentors of unforgiveness, unforgiving heart that stalk you day and night, never leaving your side and sucks every bit of joy from your life. Any person living in unforgiveness you will find live a fairly unhappy life. They do stew over things, they worry about things at night, they are angry, they are bitter. Now this is not legalism and it's not a scare tactic. This scripture verse in verse 35, rather it states the seriousness of responsible forgiving and demonstrates how unforgiveness clogs the channel of communication and sanctification between God and His people. It just blocks the flow of God in our life, if we live in unforgiveness. Lewis Meaden said there are three levels of forgiveness. First, he says, we discover the humanity of the person who hurt us. That simply means that without diminishing the sin, we admit that they are sinners just like we are sinners. Second, he says, we surrender our right to get even. This is very hard, folks. Easier said than done. Because it is natural for us to want someone else to pay for all the pain they have caused us. But in the end, we must leave all judgment in the hands of a just and a merciful God. Thirdly, he says we revise our feelings towards the other person. This means giving up our hatred and letting go of our bitterness. Ultimately, it means taking Jesus seriously when he said, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you and do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That's found in Matthew 5:44. I'll give you now a testimony here, and there are many testimonies I can give you today, but because of time, I'm going to restrict myself to one. Um, I won't take a name, but a very close family person uh, was going through intense persecution at work. She was uh, head of a HR department, and this new person came in and, uh, and kind of took over what she was doing, but took it over in a very sly uh, way and uh, started to write, you know, emails that were not right, emails with information that were really to bring her down. Many times when I spoke to her over the phone, 
on the WhatsApp chat. She said to me, I want to give up. I want to chuck in the job. She says, I can't take it anymore. I can't take it anymore. And I would say to her, sis, just hang in there. Hang in there and do the following. Pray for this person. Because we as Christians know what we see on the surface is not what we should what we understand to be because there are principalities and powers behind the scenes that do things to try and topple us. And I said, pray for this person. No matter what this person does, pray for this person. Very hard thing to do, but she did it. And every now and then I would send her comforting scripture verses and remind her to do it and remind her to do it. I spoke to her when I saw her at the family reunion and she is so happy because the boss found out what was happening. And uh, she got back her position that she lost unfairly. And now this person is actually reporting to her. And my sis is offering her all the love and you know the fellowship of Jesus Christ to her. There's no spite in it. But you see, God can turn things around when we start to pray. And in my own life, many times, I have faced unfair persecution and a loss of a position myself. At midnight when I'm working, or when I used to work in the city, I would walk up and down the uh, massive office that we had and I would pray. Pray for these people who were doing all these things, you know, to upset uh, my career flow and stuff like that. And I, I can tell you so many testimonies of how God, over time, moved these people sideways. You see? No bitterness. It was tough, but you just pray and bless them. Pray and bless them. This morning I was talking to Richard, something similar is happening in his work, and I said, Richard, you just have to pray and bless them and let God take care of everything. Amen. So I want to encourage you this morning. We just pray, no matter, it says, we love our enemies and bless those who curse us or do things to unfairly persecute us. Now, as I quickly draw to an end soon, you'll know that you have reached total forgiveness when you are able to ask God to bless those who have hurt you so deeply. This indeed is a high standard, so high that without God it is impossible. You cannot do that if you don't have God in your life to help you. That is why Smeed calls forgiveness a miracle. He's, and he is right. Total forgiveness is nothing less than a miracle of God that we extend to others. Final thoughts. Firstly, forgiveness is not an optional part of a Christian's life. It is a necessary part of what it means to be a Christian. If we are going to follow Jesus Christ, we must forgive. We have no other choice. We must forgive as God has forgiven us. Freely, completely, graciously, and totally. The miracle we have received is a miracle that we pass on to others when they offend us. Secondly, we will forgive to the extent we appreciate how much we have been forgiven. The best incentive to forgiveness is to remember how much God has already loved you and forgiven you and forgiven me. Think how many times the Lord has covered you and covered me. Think of the punishment we deserved that did not happen because of God's grace. Jesus said, He who has been forgiven little loves little. Luke 7, 47. Our willingness to forgiveness, forgive is in direct proportion to our remembrance of how much we have been forgiven. So every time you struggle with that, remember how much Jesus loved you and Jesus loved me and work it through. Mark Twain said this, and I think it is one of the most beautiful statements I've ever seen or read. He said this, Forgiveness 
is the fragrance of the violet. Sorry, for, for, forgiveness is the fragrance the violet gives to the heel that has crushed it. Do you get that? Forgiveness is the fragrance the violet gives to the heel that has crushed it. Next time, find a flower in your garden, crush it with your heel, and then try and smell it. Even though it, you crush the life out of it, your heel smells good. So I think it's such a wonderful statement to remember. We are never more like Jesus than when you forgive. And you and me will never be set free until we forgive. Release them and you will be set free. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your precious word this morning. We thank you, Lord, in hearing this, we are reminded of your great love towards us. We thank you for paying the penalty of our sin. We thank you, Lord, for redeeming us from guilt and shame, from transforming us, Lord, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. This morning, Lord, we want to express our eternal great gratitude for what you did for us on the cross of Calvary. This morning, Lord, if what we have heard is a struggle in our lives this morning, that you would help us. Help us to find freedom to forgive others who have offended us this morning. Bless each one here this morning, Lord. Bless those who couldn't make it because of illness, that your hand would be upon them too. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you.